What is up? Here we go. The Beyond Jiu Jitsu podcast. My name's Adam Childs with my man, Kieran Lefebvre. Yo. Episode 109. What's what going know? on? Man, just uh, just chilling on a Wednesday morning as usual. Yeah. Today we're talking about submission. Well, people should know from the title that they've clicked on. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> submission concepts for, well, for all levels, but submission concepts for beginners and uh, opposed to teaching some technical submissions, just some thoughts around submissions and how to better apply them or improve your submission rate. Yeah, I'm really keen on uh, this episode. So every time we do one of these concept episodes, I always like take away a key insight or I'm reminded of something that maybe you said like fucking years ago now. Um, And I don't know, I find it really valuable. We get a lot of really good feedback on the conceptual episodes because it's easy, it's hard to like listen to a podcast and be like, okay, today's class we're teaching a Delaheba sweep. Yeah. So this is what you right, do. You got your left leg here and this one here. And, and yep. your left leg out and then your left leg in <laughs> and then you shake it all about. But with this, I mean, there's no ho- hokey pokey here. It's like concepts that you can, you can like, you know, re- let, let it sink in over time, come back to it and are reminded of it in the future. And this is how I, I sort of treat it. And, uh, and yeah, I, I mean, I find that the weeks immediately after a conceptual episode, my game improves. It's so funny oh, in, that, that. in that specific area. Yeah. I mean, for sure we've, in other episodes, we would have spoken about why I, I personally think the this younger generation are getting so good so quick. And, you know, I believe it's because, you know, they haven't been around long enough to learn as many techniques as, you know, a 20-year-old versus a 30-year-old, for example, right, who both started training at the same age. You know, the 20-year-old hasn't been around as long. Mm. He couldn't have learnt as many techniques. But uh, these newer guys just have this fundamental conceptual understanding of certain positions, techniques or whatever that then, you know, really allows them to to apply them in not whatever situation but, you know, without sort of needing to follow a very rigid you know, you do this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, which there's value in that too. But, uh, you know, I think for me it's such a good way to to learn and really understand the positions. Actually, just this morning I I, I had a, a default private class this morning and – One person showed up. <laughs> yeah, it was quite funny because the more – it was uh, our 7 a.m. class, which has actually become one of the actually busier classes. Uh, it's funny in the area that our gym is – there's most like I'm pretty much friends with all the other gyms in the area. So I speak to the owners, not all the time, but, you know, see them at competitions and whatever, get along with them all. And I think our gym is one of, if not the only gym that has morning classes, right? Like the other gyms, you know, they kind of used to, but then they canceled them because not enough people turned up. It wasn't worth it. Or maybe they've only got one or two a week. Like we got morning classes Monday to Friday. And I think it's just because of where we are, like, and the current post COVID slash lockdown lifestyle where, you know, we're a bit more suburban where the gym is. So it's a bit more easy for people to come to the gym and then go home and have a shower and, you know, start their day, whether it's work from home or not. Uh, whereas some of the other gyms in the area are a bit more in commercial locations. So maybe people aren't going that way anymore that early. Anyway, it's become one of our busier classes. Like the other day there was, I don't know, like 12 or 15 people in the class or something at 7 a.m. compared to these other gyms that don't even have enough people turning up to run a class. However, sometimes the stars align and it was just me and one of my students, Alex, and it was actually worked out quite well because – This morning there was a bit of a scheduling issue where usually my wife will take Atlas, my son, to daycare, Mm. but I had to take him to the gym with me. So it actually turned out okay. So he just chilled when Alex and I did a private. Um, But anyway, even in this private, we were talking about uh, like escaping turtle sort of position. And, you know, I just believe understanding, you know, okay, well, if you're talking about escaping turtle or escaping – 
you know, back control or something. Under, in, yeah, I can teach you a step-by-step escape, but if you really understand that it's about, you know, shoulder control and having upper body control, that's what controls the back. You know, like I'll give you an example, and this is what I said to Alex, and this is still in line with the submission concepts because it's going to help make it clear why I, I really value understanding the concepts. And I think that word gets thrown away around a little bit too much, you know, but so I don't know, maybe there's a more, uh, more in-depth word, but anyway, so if, if you're turtle and let's say the person on top doesn't have a seatbelt, but they, but you know, you've ended up turtle on the bottom and they can kind of choose to control your shoulders, let's say with a seatbelt or a half Nelson or something like that, or they could control your hips. Now, which would you think is better or worse, right? I mean, it's going to be for me as the attacker is going to be controlling the shoulders. Mm. Now, some people are quickly going to say, oh, but then if you, if you can't control the shoulders, you're going to attack the hips and you're going to put a truck hook in and roll through um, and, you know, go for a truck, calf slice, banana split sort of position, whatever. You know, yes, that's, that's correct. But unless the person is specifically going for a leg entanglement attack, which isn't what we're talking about right now. We're talking about typically when you're turtle on the bottom, it's getting your back taken is the- The big risk. The imminent threat. So even if someone does a truck roll, right, and they put a truck hook in from that sort of turtle position, what's then their next step to take your back? They have to get your shoulder control, right? Or upper body control. So, you know, if I'm in turtle on the bottom and my choice is, if I have to make a choice of give up my hips or my shoulders, I'm going to give up my hips because at least then they may still take my back. But at the end of the day, to get my back and then choke me from the back, you need my upper body control. Mm-hmm. Like you can't choke me if you don't have any control of my upper body. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'll always let them take that extra step. Of course, anyone listening should know that it's never as simple as this in jujitsu. Like you can make these statements or sweeping statements there's a million what ifs and you know and if they do this and that but what about, of course right and there's always exceptions to every single rule you know like fuck i mean a basic one is you teach beginners it's either two arms in or two arms out you know but then you know as well as i know but then you got over under passes where it's one arm in one arm out you know like there's always exceptions to the rule but as a sort of blanket statement right i'll always if I have to choose, let them take that extra step. So Alex and I did some specific turtle escapes, but I also wanted to get through to him like, man, but what is crucially important is that they don't control your shoulders, right? With some type of, like I said, a seatbelt could be a power half. It could be like a hook grip or something. Yeah. Yeah. It could be, um, yeah. Like a claw grip or it could be in the, in the gi, a really strong grip is actually just grabbing the back back of the collar is a super strong grip, you know, uh, but yeah, no matter what way they go, the end result before they're choking you is controlling your upper body and your shoulders. It's a very long way of me kind of giving an example of why, you know, conceptual understanding is, is in my opinion, far superior. And on that, you, you, you know, you build on top of that your specific little, little techniques. Absolutely. And if you take your, your example of the, the – everyone – should know like you or you teach white belts um you know two arms in two arms out but then the exception is an over under pass yes but in the over under pass you need to ensure that you control the leg if you got one in and one out yeah and that is you know you understand that concept because you know the two arms in two arms out rule right so piggybacking off of that concept you can connect it to the technique and say this air quotes breaks the rule however it doesn't because if you lose control of the leg you're getting triangle yeah and i think it's uh for, for any lower level belts or any, you know, more beginners listening, there's often a, a disconnect between it. like sometimes people don't just like trust the process that you need to go through before you can replicate something like a professional does, you know. So, of course, like we want to look to the perfect – this doesn't mean – let me not send a mixed message, right? I never teach anything in my gym – that shouldn't or doesn't work 
at a professional level. You know, like sometimes I see instructors, they'll teach something and they'll actually say like, you know, this is a great one. You'll catch most white and blue belts with this one. And then, you know, but like usually purple belts and other, you know, it doesn't work. It's like, well, then I don't want to know it, mm. you know, unless, you know, unless you're, unless it's a fundamental movement that I need to learn. Right. So I'll never teach anything that doesn't, doesn't work at, at, at a professional level. Right. Unless I'm teaching something that sometimes I'll teach, okay, we're learning this, but the reason we're learning it is more so we're learning why you don't do it. Right. You know? Uh, so one of the ones is, this is again, a very beginner one. You learn that if you're opening someone's clothes guard, you know, and you stand the wrong leg or you don't have posture or whatever, you get arm barred. So you'll learn that as the person on the bottom. Oh yeah. So we're doing this arm bar, but like it almost never comes up in a role at a professional level. Why? Cause these professionals have learned and drilled this very basic sort of movement. And yes. Yeah, so we want to look to the professionals and try to replicate them because they've already done all this work and proven techniques. Lockie actually said this ages ago as a way to, you know, I think I've mentioned this before, like Lockie the whole, Giles. yeah, yeah. Yep. Like the whole standing on the shoulders of giants, like mm. no one, no single, you know, mechanical engineer started by first reinventing the wheel and then designing a fucking, you know, Ferrari, you yeah. know, like they're all piggybacking off work that's already been done and proven. Like it's the evolution of everything, right? So of course we want to do that with the sport as well, but there's a certain process you need to, you need to follow. It'd kind of be like, I'll give you one uh, for any, any, any cooks out there. Do you know what a, um, God, what are they? A microplane is. You, they're like those. They're kind of like a grater, but they to to cut yes. things super fine. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. And you'll be told. Let's say you're first learning how to use one. You'll be told never use it without the guard. Yeah. Right. The yeah. finger guard because it will like it will cut your finger right off yeah. like a professional microplane. Yeah. You're told never use it without a guard. But then you'll look a pre professional chef and they use it without a guard. It's like, okay, that doesn't mean you as the beginner go, well, they don't use it. So I don't need to like, yeah. same as you don't, as a beginner, look at, you know, some professional skateboarder and go, well, they're not wearing protective equipment. So I'm not going to wear protective equipment. You know, like there's a, you know, you have to go through a certain process. It's the same in, same in chess. Like you need to understand the basic concepts before you know when to break them. That's right, exactly. So all these exceptions to the rules, if you don't fully understand the rules, the rules and why yeah. they're in place, you don't understand why and where you can break them. Yep. Anyway, a lot of uh, caffeine starting to hit me, I guess, a lot of rambling. <laughs> Let's go on to some more sort of specific submission concepts that um, – concepts, ideas, tips, tricks, whatever way you want to think about it that, uh, that I want to go over. All right. So this is one of my favorite ones and it's to do with, it's to do with applying chokes. And I've been doing this for, actually no one ever explained this to me. I think this was one of the rare occasions where I figured something out by myself. Oh, wow. right? I'm usually a copy paste kind of guy. <laughs> right? Adam Child's no, originals. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, by far, you know, I'm definitely not the only person that does this. That's for sure. And I think that about any technique I make up, make up, you know, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, like I don't then come up with a name for it unless I'm just so people ask me, what's that called? And I'm like, I don't know, it's this. Oh, did you invent that? And I was like, no, surely someone else has done it because yeah. I don't think I'm that ahead of the curve, but I don't know what it's called. So for now, I'll call it this. <clears throat> anyway, what I personally do when applying chokes is I almost like to bluff people. And what I mean by that is let's say I have on a whatever choke, a rear naked choke. I do it a lot with dust chokes because it's definitely one of my long arms works really well for me in no gi. So if I go for a dust choke, right, and you're in the submission, and if I go from connecting the choke and I go from, let's say, you know, 0%, whatever my squeeze capacity is, right, let's go – let's say I go from zero to a hundred straight away with that squeeze and you there as the person in the choke, you know, that squeeze, let's say it goes for like, you know, three, four, five seconds and you're not about to go out yet mm -hmm. or whatever. And, 
and you've realized like you don't need to tap or you realize you can hang this for a little bit more, I then have nowhere else to go from there, right? And this, sorry, I'm, this is all, this is a rather time consuming bluff. So obviously if I've got 10 seconds left on the clock, this isn't applicable, but yeah. So if I can't get you with that 100%, and you survive that four or five seconds and you don't pass out or tap, I've then got nowhere else to go from there and I'm left with gassed arms or grips and I'm left with you sitting there thinking, oh, that's all he had. Like he's not going to – he can't finish it, right? So that's not what I do, right? What I do is let's say – let me just pick some arbitrary numbers. Let's say – 20% squeeze is what I need just to maintain the position without having you like freely escape, right? So obviously 20% is then my minimum. Obviously 100% would be my, let's say 100% is in, that's my max. I can maintain that squeeze for eight seconds before my my grips gas out or whatever, right? So I'm not going to go from 20% to 100, right? I'm going to go from 20% to like, 60%. And I'm going to sell it like I'm actually going for the submission. Right. But the thing is like, if you tap in that four, if you tap in four or five seconds, cool. I like, you know, I just saved myself a whole lot of effort, but the thing is 60%, like the hundred percent I can maintain for eight seconds, that's 60%. I can maintain for, I don't know, a minute or whatever it is. So if then at that, at that 60% squeeze, you haven't tapped yet, you're lying there thinking like, man, this is all he's got, you know, and he can't finish it. And then I go from 60 to 80 and then all of a sudden you go, oh, fuck, he wasn't actually even squeezing yet, you know. And then I, man, not even nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 10, right, I then get the yeah, <laughs> <What? laughs> I get the tap at 80%. I rarely, rarely That's have so to have to squeeze a submission at 100%. You fucker. I, as soon as you started describing this, I'm like, you bastard, you've done that to me so many times. Dude, I do it so all, many times. all the time. <laughs> and because, <laughs> yeah, that's – and that 60%, even if I'm not bluffing the – like, so sometimes depending on the individual, you know, that 60% might not even be a bluffed – squeeze attempt, I might have to ramp it up to like, okay, 60% is like my minimums, <clears throat> my minimum squeeze. Mm-hmm. And then my bluff attempt will be 80% mm-hmm. and then I'll go to a hundred. But that 60%, I can stay there for so long. And then that's also, if you're lying there thinking, man, I'm sweet. He doesn't have it, whatever, blah, blah, blah. That's still a 60% squeeze where you're having reduced blood to the brain. Right. And as that drags on, and, and I can stay there for ages. It becomes very, very taxing. And I do believe that somewhere, I think, I don't even know where it was, but I believe I saw, you know, Gordon Ryan talking about something similar when he applies chokes or something it, it came up in an instructional or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I do it all the time. doesn't work with joint lock submissions, right, because mm-hmm. he – can't have that slow burn or grind, but I love doing this with my chokes all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. I love that you as well. I noticed. Like yeah. that you, Forget now that it, I'm yeah. saying it, you're like, yeah. fuck, you do do that. Yeah, yeah, 100% you do it. But you'll notice that, you know, next time we roll and we're in a, you know, and I catch you in something or whatever. We're like, even, oh, this is the 60%. <laughs> yeah, but now even knowing it, you'll still feel like, okay, yeah, it's 60%, but like, fuck, like it's taxing for yeah, you, yeah. right? But it's not really that taxing for my arms, depending yeah. on the position, right? And, yeah. and what's going on. Well, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because if you have me and there's like 10 seconds left on the clock and you have a choke and you're you're going, you're like giving it 100%, you have that mental battle with yourself. Like I can hang for another few seconds. Like I can, I can beat the clock. That's right, yeah. So if you come out of the gate, like guns blazing, so to speak, and you're going for 100%, then your opponent will have that mental like, oh, I can just I can just wait out their big burst and then it's going to end. But if it, come, if it comes on like 60, 80, and then 100, you don't know where the 100 is. That's right. And it's just it's just this never-ending pressure. Yeah. It would kind of be it's like- 4D it, level chess, bro. Yeah. <laughs> like imagine if you just had to, you know, kind of withstand 
someone like just shoving you once mm. and you've just got to survive that shove mm. opposed to someone like perpetually pushing into mm. you mm. and just they just never stop pushing, mm. you know, like that consistent pressure. Mm. And like I said, I rarely, particularly with Dars chokes, I rarely ever get to 100 squeeze, rarely ever, mm. you know. It, just that slow grind and, and especially when I know I've got time on the clock – or cook like, the beans, baby. Bro, cook them <laughs> all day. You know? And it's, I mean, look at look at a python, right? They don't, you know, or any kind of um, constrictor, like, boa yeah, constrictor. Constri boa constrictor or, or whatever. They don't just catch their prey, just go in one squeeze. Mm. Like it's just this all-consuming. And it actually makes me think of uh, of rolling and training with, with Bernardo Faria, you know, where he would – by if it's a 10 minute roll, his in his intensity only ever went up. And it wasn't like because he started at low intensity either. It wasn't like he was lazy and just more and more got into the role. Like he started the roles intense. Mm. But then by that the ninth or tenth minute, he's going even harder than he was at the start. Like it only ever got more pressure, more <laughs> more intensity. It's kind of like that, you know, just ramping it up, you know, and you never know where the hundred is as as the person on the receiving end. You never know where the hundred is, you know. But like for me, if I'm going to go for something with a hundred, um, it either needs to land or I need to be okay with it failing whereas with this you know so like if you're shooting a double leg it's kind of like it has to be a hundred percent you know and you're either going to hit that double or you're going to get sprawled on or whatever it is and you know and you deal with that but it has to be a hundred otherwise it, it just it never lands but a submission doesn't have to go from zero to a hundred to land particularly once you're in you the know? position and if and if a hundred if the result is either landing the submission or it failing for me, it's not worth the risk of the failure when when I don't even need to take. It's an unnecessary risk, in my opinion. You know? Yeah, because you're taxing, like you said, you're you're busting your grips or you're you're taxing your arms. Like I was in a I was in a comp and I was stuck in a uh, rear naked choke, uh, but he didn't quite have it, um, and he cranked as hard as he could for as long as he could, and then finally I, I was able to escape it. And his arms were gassed, and then Go I just on. passed him, took his back, choked him. Yeah, he yeah. was done. And his his arms after it, he said, "Oh man, my arms were fucked from that." Yeah. Like yeah. he completely gassed. Yeah. So he should have cooked me in sixty percent, improved his position, like improved the choke, and then like ramped it up and taken for a hundred because he had like yeah. we had like three minutes left yeah. on the clock. Yeah, and I think the only time I really go zero to a hundred is like I said, if I'm about to run out of time mm. or if I kind of know that I'm already going to lose the position. Right. So you have to give it a good shot. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like, kind of like, man, I don't think I'm going to get this anyway. Like I think I'm going to lose the position. Mm -hmm. So that in that moment, it's worth that. Well, when I give a hundred percent, I'm either getting it or failing. Cause I'm kind of like, I'm going to lose this position anyway, you know? So I may as well give it a hundred because the, you know, I feel like I'm losing it anyway. So the alternative is potentially I get it. If I don't, I'm going to end up where I was going to be anyway. Yeah, that makes sense. So one thing I've been thinking about with chokes a lot, like in the last few months, uh, particularly since my neck, because I have a little bit of a neck, not injury, but a niggle at the moment, is how much pressure my jaw can take. Because I don't know. Because a lot of the time <laughs> when someone's choking, you know, you choke across the face. If you can't like the tuck in the chin, we spoke about that to death. You know, um, it's not a defense. So just choke across the the, the bottom of the jaw. I've had people do that to me and big, strong dudes like yourself or, or like Joey or whoever, like crank across my jaw. And I've let my jaw take some serious fucking pressure, like some serious- You're wondering like, at what point it would break. I'm wondering at what point it's going to break because my jaw is not the same since starting to get sick. <laughs> like it cracks all the time without even like me being like, you know, chewing or eating something. It just like all of a sudden will seize up and like crack or whatever. And, um, you know, it, it's moving in ways that it, it shouldn't and it never used to. So I'm wondering out loud, like, at, should I be concerned? Because there's been times, particularly Joey's had some deep fucking, like, heavy pressure on my jaw. And I'm just like, nah, there's no choke. It just hurts my jaw. I'm like, nah, fuck ya. I'm not tapping. <laughs> like, it, And then I've had that thought cross my mind deep in that submission, like, fuck, my jaw might break here. Like it might break. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. am I willing to let my jaw break for this? Yeah, um, I don't know what the break force is of a jaw. 
I, I'm, I'm like, let me know once you find yeah, out. Yeah, <laughs> I think I might find out one day because I don't know I'm going to change, but like, it's really silly. And I mean, I've been in positions where I've just been like, nah, fuck, it's not worth it. Like I'm tapping because um, I've just, you know, started to hear the cracking and like it starts to move and it's a lot of pressure. I'm like, fuck, I don't want it to break. But yeah, I'm just wondering out loud how, how much force it can take before it breaks and and like what that would feel like. Because, you know, with, well, with your arm, you, you, with an armbar, right? Someone has an armbar, you can feel it because the pain is, it, it just keeps increasing. But with the jaw pressure, it's just consistent, if that makes sense. So I'm wondering like- how I would know. <laughs> I think <laughs> also because it's a different sort of pressure, right? It's, yeah, um, it's, it's and it's, yeah, like it's a, it's a compression. compression. Yeah. Yeah. So it would be similar to, so like when you, when you're manipulating a joint, mm. you know, and this will lead me on to my next point, right? Ooh, uh, which is, which is, <laughs> did you ever see that? It was a kind of in YouTube's earlier days, there was a viral video chimpanzee riding on a Segway? No, I don't think I've seen that. <laughs> I'll show it to you. If anyone wants Segway. to, in your free time, Google uh, uh, a chimpanzee riding on a Segway. I remember Segway. It's definitely not – I mean, it's maybe animal abuse. I don't know. They have. I think, I think police use Segways in Darwin. Do in, they? In Darwin City, they the police have like off-road Segways with big off-road tires and they cruise around the city in these, in these Segway like – Big fucking big wheeled Segway things. Oh, I've, yeah. never, I've never, I've never <laughs> ridden one. Yeah, maybe one day. Not either, but um, it's funny. But yeah, un- understanding joint manipulation, right? Because when you're manipulating a joint, like it's important that you understand in what way the submission is manipulating the joint. Mm. Okay, so you know if you don't know anything about an elbow joint or a shoulder joint, like they're two very different joints, right? Mm. In the way that they get manipulated for a submission. Uh, You know, because I feel like most people should know this, but like your shoulder joints, a ball and socket joint, you know, similar to your hip is Mm kind of like a ball and socket joint. Whereas like your elbow is not, it's like a hinge joint. Mm -hmm. So they get manipulated in different ways. But going back to the jaw thing, when you're bending a joint in a direction that it doesn't want to go, right? It usually results in, depending on the the joint and the way it's being twisted, like cartilage, meniscus, ligaments, they're all getting like pulled and twisted in directions that they don't want to go. Bone can be hitting on bone depending on the condition of your body and whatever. And all that stuff is incredibly painful and feels like something's going to break. But the compression that's happening in your jaw, it would kind of be similar to imagine if I just – you know, was squashing your forearm between like a hydraulic press mm. or something, like you wouldn't necessarily know like when it's going to break. Like, of course, it would be incredibly painful, like your muscles would be getting squashed, but you know, like it's not like the joint. So it's not like the joint of your jaw is getting pulled in a direction. Like it would be a different pain to if someone like stuck their fingers in your mouth and pulled your jaw down. Yeah. You right? would feel when it's you about would, to break. You would yep. feel when it's about to break because mm-hmm. it's pulling the joint past a direction or or uh, its limitations. But that compression of that squeeze from someone choking across your face would be, yeah, like your like a limb or a part of your body being compressed in a hydraulic press, you wouldn't necessarily know, like of course it would be incredibly painful, like getting choked across the face is, mm. but you wouldn't have that same inherent feeling of like when it's going to break, mm. you know? Yeah, that's what I'm worried about. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll we'll find out. We'll I figure mean, it out. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I imagine I'd be the, worst, the next man. day you'll be, be like, so you'll bad. be like, ads, uh, <laughs> well, if, like, if, if, it ha- if it happens, jaw. you'll have to adapt your coffee straws. For, yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Soup straws. Yeah, I'd have to have like a little gap in the wires to fucking yeah. jam in my soup yeah. straw. Man, yeah, that's fucked. I'm not letting my jaw break, but I mean, fuck, I hope it doesn't happen. But yeah. anyway. But, but, um, <laughs> anyway, so understanding joint manipulation. Uh, so let's, let's go over a, a simple one first because there's even, in my opinion, this is a very – this is something you explain to white belts, but in my – it, you know, in my time as an instructor or even just as a student of jiu-jitsu, I've seen blue, purple, brown. I've seen questionable black belts not even know this. <laughs> questionable. <right? laughs> but uh, I feel like this is something that if you're wearing a blue belt, you should know this because mm. it's pretty fundamental. But like even just understanding 
how the elbow joint works, like with an armbar, you know. So sometimes you're just told, you know, pull in the direction of the pinky and and that's pretty self-explanatory, right? But not – people don't usually, without it being explained to them, make the connection of like, okay, well, so what is actually the control point to be able to manipulate this joint correctly – and, you know, and it's the, the wrist, mm. right? And you see that at a, at a professional level where if someone's in an armbar, they'll just essentially be, you know, for lack of a better term, like doing shuckers with their wrist because mm. if they can change the orientation of their wrist, it actually changes the orientation of their elbow. So if you go from pulling, you know, if you pull down in the direction of the pinky, right? That's what bends your elbow the wrong way. But if someone like turns their pinky up, all of a sudden you get all this extra range in your elbow, right? So it's really important that you understand how the joint that you're manipulating works. Mm. I mean, you don't have to be a physio or a doctor, but just a basic understanding of how the joint works and then how the particular submission is affecting that joint. Mm. So I'll give you another example. And because I'm not going to sit here and explain every single joint and every single submission and how right this is do your own work people it's concepts of, right yeah it's <laughs> concepts like if you don't know ask your instructor when they're teaching a kimura like how it works and because again the title of this is submission concepts for beginners so beginners sometimes you know until it's pointed out to them they don't realize that you know a kimura is the same mechanic as an umna plata mm-hmm. right like but so if you understand how the actual shoulder manipulation works, same with conceptually, beginners don't understand that a DAS choke, an anaconda choke, a triangle choke, an arm triangle, like all these chokes mechanically work the same. You know, it's their own shoulder pushing into one carotid artery and it's one of my limbs blocking the other carotid artery, whether, that, whether that's my bicep or my forearm or my leg, depending on the choke. Mm-hmm. Uh, but one of the ones I like explaining the most is calf crushes or bicep crushes, calf slices, bicep slices, whatever you want to call it. This is one of my favorite submissions to explain of what's actually happening to the joint. Firstly, let me say calf crushes absolutely suck. I don't recommend doing them because they're a bit of a Russian roulette. You can blow out your own knee. You can be the attacker have someone fully locked in a calf crush and your knee can go before theirs. Typically it would be your LCL or it could be your lateral meniscus could go. But Sounds like you're speaking from experience here. Adam. <laughs> this is- hmm, which seems so. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's just a lot of talk that goes on your own knee. And this isn't just me being butt hurt about hurting myself, but uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you three examples, right? So first was me uh, in a competition – calf crushing someone, had them dead to rights in a calf crush and my own LCL tore and went. Did you win? I did, yeah. I let go of the submission, like my knee exploded, yep. let go of the submission straight away and then carried on the, the match and won and then I had to fight another match after that and my knee was just like dog shit but won that match too. And it was quite funny because then when we were at the podium, the guy who I tore my LCL with, it's actually Sonny Brown, right? Um, oh, yeah, Sun, Sonny Sun, Brown Breakdown. Yeah, Sonny Shout Brown Breakdown. Shout out to Sonny Brown. Yeah, he's got a really good podcast YouTube channel, I think, yep, as well. Yep. It's called he, Sonny Brown Breakdown. Yeah, and he um does he did the does the commentating on the subversion events, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. for the international listeners is like a local It's now on Flow Grappling. Yeah, the last one was on Flow Grappling, but it's like a for lack of a better term, it's like a who's number one event mm. in the sense that it's, you know, you've just got your pre-mate, your fixed matches yep. and whatever. You have a fight card and off you go. Uh, yeah, and it was funny. When we were at the podium, um, <laughs> he comes up to me and he's like, he's like, hey, bro, uh, he's like, did you d- did you hear a big pop like during our match? Like when, in that calf slice? And I was like, yeah, bro, that was my knee. And he goes, oh, thank God, I thought it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll care for that physio. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm like, nah, dude, my knee exploded big time. Oh, and he no was way. like, oh my god, you okay? Blah blah blah. That's blah. so funny. Yeah, when was this? This is obviously Man, in Australia. I, yeah. Um. Oh, bro, age, ages Were ago. You brown or blue? I uh, definitely wasn't blue belt. That's for sure. A white belt? No. <laughs> no, this was like oh, calf crush. Is yeah. that legal at 
No, Blue? it's not legal. Oh, until it must brown. be brown. I yeah, can't. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it was a black belt. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it was definitely a black belt. Oh, okay, yeah, shit. Yeah. There you go. But anyway, it was years ago. Uh, it was just a local competition here in Sydney. But yeah, it was re- it was really funny. He just like he was like, and I think his girlfriend was sitting next to him or partner wife. I'm not sure. But yeah, he was he was like, oh my god, I thought it was my name. <laughs> I'm like, nah, dude, that was mine. It went bad. Uh, you enjoy that yeah. uh, that podium there. So. Yeah. <laughs> and so that was the first one. Another one is. Um, only just recently, a few months, a uh, month ago or something, Marillo, who's the the head instructor at the Alliance, Alliance Northern <laughs> Beaches in Sydney. So he fought Warwick, who is another local Sydney black belt, and he's fought Warwick lots of times. Warwick's a good, tough guy, but Marillo, man, I mean, he's a bronze medalist from Worlds. He's a black belt from Mario Hayes, incredibly talented. I'm not taking digs at, at anyone in Australia. I'm more propping up Marillo to say that like He's Murillo's far above and beyond this, the typical standard in Australia. He's mm. very, very good. And he's fought Warwick a bunch of times. And then I saw that at this previous competition, the, the podium photo when Warwick had won and Murillo was in second. And I was like, how, how did Warwick beat Murillo? Turned out Murillo went to calf crush Warwick, had him in a calf crush and dislocated his own knee mm. while applying the submission. Um, and then the third one would be at a – that seminar with Craig Jones, I don't know if you recall him saying this, but there was a position where you could come up into a calf crush and even Craig was like, don't fucking come up into a calf crush, you'll blow out your own knee, Mm. stupid submission. You know, so you've got me as personal experience, you've got Murillo, uh, you know, teammate personal experience, then you've got one of the best leg lockers in the game even saying, don't apply calf crushes, they're fucking stupid. Mm. You know, you blow out your own knee. Anyway, don't do them. But I do love explaining the concept of how it works and understanding the joint better because the way the analogy – you know there's an, 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 an analogy to analogy explain Adam, it. send it. The way I love to explain it is so how a calf crush or a bicep crush works is that you've got this hinge joint, okay, and think about the hinge joint like a nutcracker like an actual nutcracker like those, you know, like the metal ones. When you have a nutcracker, you have the hinge, right, which in this case would be our knee, mm-hmm. and then you've got the, the handles of the nutcracker, which in this case would be our shin and our thigh. Mm-hmm. You put a nut in it, right, which in this case, if when you're doing a calf crush, would be the other person's shin that mm-hmm. they put in behind the, behind the hinge, and then you crack the nut. And that works because the hinge is stronger than the nut. But if you imagine you got a nutcracker and you put, put like a titanium ball bearing in there and tried to crack it, what's, go, what's going to go first? The hinge. The hinge is going to explode, right? Mm-hmm. So that's what's happening when you do a calf crush or a bicep crush. You're actually gapping the knee. And physios actually give you this as an exercise. If, you, you might have, if you've ever had a knee injury, sometimes a physio will tell you to put like a tennis ball in behind your knee yep. and just kind of gently pull your heel to your butt. Yep. And it's called gapping the knee because you're opening the knee joint a little bit. And that's essentially what's happening with a calf crush. So conceptually understanding the mechanics of the submission you're applying is not only going to help you understand it better, but it's going to help you apply it better and help you apply other submissions that are connected to it. So like I said, understanding the actual mechanics and how a triangle choke is applied is going to help you understand and realize that whether it's a triangle with your legs or an arm triangle or a dust stroke or an anaconda choke, like these all mechanically work the same way. Right, So then that can help you understand, you know, if you're really good at a regular leg triangle from closed guard and then, you know, maybe you've been training for two years and all of a sudden you start messing around with dust chokes, right? and, but you're already a pro at triangles and you understand how they fundamentally work, how the application works, that's going to help your dust choke straight away because mm-hmm. you're going to understand, okay, well, I can, I can see his own shoulders not getting pushed into his neck and, oh, there's nothing touching this side of his neck, whatever. So – really understanding the joint that you're attacking and how it wants to be manipulated is crucial to kind of improving your ability to finish a submission. Is it the same with a bicep slicer? Is that different again to the the analogy with a nutcracker? No, no, it'd be the same thing. Right. The thing with bicep slicers is, uh, well, they're, they're rarer in occurrence. They don't come up as often, but they're also 
yeah, like you almost never see them, mm. but I wouldn't with bicep crushes say something like I would with a calf crush where I'm like, mm. oh, just don't go for it because then it's it's a shin and a knee versus an elbow. Mm. And typically like you're, you know, it's not as dangerous Russian roulette wise because my my knee is usually far more durable than your elbow, right? Mm-hmm. Like I should be able to gap your elbow before my knee explodes. Mm. But when it's knee versus knee, that's mm. not always the case, right? That's not to say, I mean, me as someone with shitty knees and, you know, multiple surgeries on my knees and they're my personal problem area. I wouldn't be surprised if my knee went before someone's elbow did, <laughs> but I think for most people you'd be okay. However, they rarely come up, right? Like yeah. you don't, I can't remember the last time I saw one in a professional competition. No, the, the only time I've been sub sub is we have a, a guy at the gym, Eric, we've spoken about, he's working on certain things with, with them at the moment. He's incorporated them into his game and I got caught in one and I, I tapped because of the, like it, it came on so quick and all of a sudden like the immense amount of pressure and pain through my, my bicep was just like, nah, fuck, I'm out. Yeah, I've never felt one with none I have biceps, but I yeah. imagine they're pretty painful. Oh, very painful. <laughs> Particularly <laughs> yeah. like jacked, <laughs> yeah. like you're, you're fucking yeah. yoked like yeah. I am. But it's the same, yeah. So calf crushes and bicep crushes, you'll feel the pain in the muscle and in training oh, yeah. you'll typically tap from that crushing pain in the muscle yeah. but yeah it's important to understand for like a month yeah but it's important to understand that it's actually gapping the joint right right okay, yeah and we'll rip the joint apart right. you can do the same thing with a straight foot lock you know I was just thinking of that so there's kind of there's four ways you can finish a straight foot lock three that work right you've got the very original way to do it, which doesn't work anymore, which is just hyper extending the foot, just turning it, like just pointing the person's toes. Mm-hmm. doesn't really work anymore. That's where the name comes from, straight foot lock. All right, jiu-jitsu has changed a lot since then, so you're not going to get a tap like that anymore unless it's someone completely brand new or someone with a bad ankle. Mm-hmm. So the more typical way is rotating the, the ankle, essentially applying the same sort of pressure you would as a toe hold, still considered a straight foot lock. You've got applying external rotation like an Aoki lock or you've got another variation where you can kind of still, you'll still be rotating the ankle in some regard, but then you'll also be like dead lifting the foot off. If you imagine you're clamped down on the ankle and you're going to remove their foot as if it were like a detachable like action figure or yeah, Lego yeah. or something, like imagine you could literally just go – and yeah. pop the foot off. So then you're actually like stretching the joint, right? This doesn't work with all joints, but it works with the ankle joint, right? Like you can, there's a lot of like bones in the ankle and the foot and there's a lot of give in the ankle. Hence why you can be walking down the street and roll your ankle. Mm. And I fuck, I've been walking for 30 years and I still fuck it up, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so that's another one where you can introduce, you know, space into the joint. And, you know, that in combination with the rotation and whatever. But, yeah, joint manipulation. Again, I spent longer talking about it than I wanted to. But, yeah, it's very – the the I don't want – even concepts may be the wrong word, especially in this case, but it's very important you understand the mechanics of, of the joint that you're manipulating. And that's, that's even at the highest levels as well. And I, I do want to take the time to – so I was listening to the uh, Jeremy Skinner's interview on the Bulletproof for BJJ podcast. It's as of the recording, it, it came out um, very recently. I think it's about a week old by the time this launches. Give it a listen. It's really awesome. Uh, and Jeremy, who, if you don't know who he is, um, we spoke about him during the ADCC episode. He's competing in the upcoming ADCC. He's a, I think we spoke to him when he was on this podcast too. And he was on this podcast. <laughs> and um, so he was talking about outside heel hooks and he understands – so in depth about the position that he will be hesitant to go for an outside heel hook because he finds that at the highest levels and even people that are crazy in his words will allow him to essentially break their ankle before the knee goes. And then that will enable them to escape because in an outside heel hook, it puts a lot of torque through the ankle. um, And if you don't apply it to specifically attack the knee, then you, your opponent can escape by allowing the ankle to break because they, they get enough room to then pop it out and off they go. Yeah. Okay. They have a whole bunch of torn uh, ligaments and, and things like that in the ankle. We're not talking about bone breaks. We're talking about like sprains essentially. Jeremy does a really good job of explaining it. Um, but 
that's that's like putting these concepts into practice in the highest level that he's actually, you know, his breaking mechanics are that good that he can break someone's ankle, but then they still can escape and, and you know, potentially win the match. So he doesn't get them out of there. Um, yeah. I, I just think that's like, that's really knowing the breaking mechanics of your submission. Yeah. And I'm, I mean, I think that's in at the highest, not even at the highest level, but, it, but at an educated level, it's, it's really important to understand that as well, just to, to fundamentally be a good training partner yeah. as well. Cause uh, it's kind of like, don't get me wrong. There's responsibility on both parties, but I'm always going to put more responsibility on myself to look after myself and my training partner. Mm. And it's, you know, so some people have this mentality of, of, of like, oh, well, you know, it's their responsibility to whatever, maybe a bit more like that in competition. But if understanding the breaking points is going to help me, like if I'm with a teammate, a partner who doesn't want to tap, like, mm. I, you know, I'm probably going to be the sort of person who's just going to let it go. Yeah, totally. You know, yeah, it's their responsibility, but it's no different to driving a car on the road. Yeah. Everyone has more responsibility, but you might know this having not, you know, in the recent history doing your motorbike license, mm. Just to paraphrase, they probably didn't say these exact words, but at least when I did my motorbike license years ago, you're pretty much told, assume that everyone on the road's a moron yep. and that no one can see you. Yep. And, you know, like, and, and, accordingly. Yeah. and that's kind of how you have to ride. Like, I'm not just going to ride around being like, oh, well, it's their responsibility, you know. Not to like, kill me. Yeah, not to kill me. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, like you've, you kind of at the same time got to be, a little, I don't trust everyone <laughs> sort yeah. of thing when you're, when you're on the road, right? Yeah. When you're driving a car, riding a bike. And so same sort of thing, like. Particularly you know, with heel hooks. Especially with, yeah. with, yeah, something like that. And if there is a gap in knowledge between you and your uh, training partner, but they're very like, you know, if they're, they're still rolling really hard, they don't want to concede anything, but they don't have that experience and knowledge in leg entanglements, they may be willing to do something that is completely insane. Um, like I recently, probably a couple months ago, I was rolling with another blue belt, had them in a heel hook and they were not tapping and I was not really applying it, but I was looking at it, looking at them. I'm like, you're right, you know, sort of thing. And I ended up just letting it go and, and, and just being like, no, fuck it. It's not worth it because they were, I could tell they were twisting out and they were willing to blow out their own knee. I'm like, no, I'm letting, yeah. I'm letting go. Yeah. And you know, it's insane. Cause then they can't train the next day or yeah, whatever, 100%. which means you then don't get to train with them the next day. And then all of a sudden you've put your training partner out six months because you were too stubborn to let go of like a submission in training. Yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, you could use this to your advantage and like do stupid things to get out of submissions. Cause you know, your training partner will let go. That's not a good, um, idea either. <laughs> you you <laughs> let you let it go, and then the next day you see their like Instagram post. Fucking Kieran couldn't tap me. What yeah. a loser! <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. But um, but you know, like yeah. it's you know you've you got to wonder as well when when you go to the professional level if you've got it in you to to break someone's leg or arm. You know, chokes are mm. nice because you just put someone to sleep. Yeah. But me personally, I definitely don't have it in me to to break a limb, even though I know I, right. I know so if I could. you're in, so if you're in a situation where you're at like worlds, it's the finals and you've got someone in an arm bar, you know, they're not going to tap, you know that you have to break their arm. You're not going to do it. I don't know, man. I'd fucking break it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd fucking break it, dude. Straight up. I'm breaking it. Yeah. I don't know. Like it, de it depends. It's something, it's funny, right? Like, Arm bars are maybe something I don't find as cringy, mm. but I mean, man, like oh, Craig's fight versus Vinny. If you know, if anyone didn't watch Craig Jones versus Vinny Magalhães, it happened during lockdowns and stuff. And like, I think Craig broke his fibula in half or something. Like, I I if you, if you watch that fight, like it's sickening just to watch to watch what's happening to oh, Vinny's legs. What about and, and I believe in the, like I couldn't hear the audio or I can't remember if I watched it muted. You got to like, stop I, doing that, man. That's cheating. You got to stop watching these, these, these gruesome shit. Oh, right, right. Muted no, audio. No, you no, always do that. No, but not, no, not to do with the sound of the leg, but right. I believe uh, it was a while ago. So my memory of it's a bit foggy, but I yeah. believe Craig was even in the fight, like saying to Vinny, bro, tap, like, what do you, 
like, what are you doing? You know, that's just insane. And you know, and I've, uh, I didn't hear this interview, but um, I've been told there was an interview with Craig when he was talking about, you know, the heel hook he had on Leandro Lowe, you know, the late Leandro mm. Lowe at, mm. at Craig's breakout year in ADCC, mm. where he had Lowe in a heel hook. Lowe got out and Craig took his back and choked him. But I remember him, I don't remember, I remember someone telling me that there was an interview where Craig said, oh, like with that heel hook, I heard. Lowe's knee and it sounded like it made the sound of tearing corrugated cardboard like it just went like you know and oh. I don't know maybe it's just me being like squeamish with legs because I've had so many like knee injuries yeah. but I don't know like watch the Craig and Vinny fight and handy. then ask yourself do you have that in you to do yeah, that's what fair enough. to do what he did maybe ignorance is bliss in that case and but I, then again like i don't know i guess it's one of those things you could never really answer it till you're there in the yeah. moment because if it was yeah the final at worlds gonna get you a gold medal at yeah. worlds you know yeah. or Change gold medal at adcc or whatever, or whatever would yeah. you break it i mean i can sit here and say yeah man i would or nah man i wouldn't i don't yeah, think you'd ever really know until, until you're, you're there until you're there in yeah. the moment you know I was training with Toby and I had him in a heel hook and he just didn't want to tap. Yeah. And he's, his knee popped three times. It was like very, like kind of like what you're describing, but less extreme. It was like pop, pop, pop in his knee. I like freaked the fuck out. I let go straight away and like, you know, I was like, you're right. Yeah. Um, but apparently he's okay. Um, I don't know, but I don't know if your knee can like pop like that. And I don't know what that sound is. It's got to be some form of meniscus doing something, right? It's, clickety clack, it's yeah, fucked. Clickety clack, it's <laughs> fucked, baby. <laughs> Throwback. Yeah. Yeah, man, but it scared the shit out of me. Um, I thought I like completely fucking destroyed his Yeah, name. I don't he like that. Ended up being sound. okay. I think I said this a while ago. I don't know if it was in an episode or or just in, in conversation, but a, a little while ago I was rolling with one of the blue belts at the gym, Nicholas, mm. and I oh, had him just yeah. in a straight footlock. And it was so tight and deep. And I was like, man, why isn't he tapping? And I was like, man, this fucking kid. You know? <laughs> this and, stubborn bastard. Yeah. And it's not like I cranked it, but I was like incrementally increasing the how much I was putting mm-hmm. it on. And it wasn't at a point where it wasn't – I didn't take it to where it was going to break his ankle, but I was just slowly putting it more and more on. Mm-hmm. And I was well past where I thought – I was like, man, like you should be tapping. But mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I'll go a little bit more. And then his ankle popped. I let go straight away. And I was like, fuck, bro, are you okay, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, it's fine. It pops all the time. I was like, dude, we spent like maybe – 45 minutes of me being like, bro, are you okay? <laughs> like oh. obviously not 45 minutes, yeah, but yeah, yeah. spent a long time saying, man, are you okay? No, it pops all the time. It's fine. You know, blah, blah, blah. Let's keep going. Like, man. And then even after class, dude, I'm sorry. Is your ankle okay? Yeah, yeah. Pops all the time. It's fine. And I said, I said, bro, you should have tapped. And he's like, no, no, it's all the time, all the time. And I said, I bet you motherfucker come in here tomorrow with your ankle taped. He's like, no, no, no it's fine. What happens the next day? <laughs> Comes in with his ankle taped. He had to tape his ankle for like a couple of weeks. Oh. I'm like, was that from the footlock? He's like, yeah. I'm like, dude. <laughs> um, That's anyway. fucking hilarious. Goddamn, Nicholas. Yeah. So the the final concept I kind of want to mention is is just a bit of a broad one, but it's a, kind of more something to think about when you're defending or escaping submissions but that's also going to help you on the other side of it, Mm. of attacking it, which is just a very simple statement of like angles are everything. So if, if I could give one piece, if someone said, Oh, what's one piece of advice to escape any submission, right? And that's all the context you're given, right? Just oh, one piece of advice to escape any submission would be something along the lines of, Oh, well angles, angles are everything. If you can ruin the angle, your opponent is trying to create it, to some degree can like can ruin the submission. Yep. So triangles are a very good one, yep. right? Like if a triangle from guard, mm-hmm. right? You know, arm bars are another one. You know, you typically need to be 90 degrees to the person, you know, even you say like a, a rear naked choke, I'm sure you've had it where someone has kind of slipped off your back. And instead of it being a rear naked choke, it's kind of like side. a side naked choke, yeah. if you will. Yeah. And yeah, maybe, you know, if you're not in the mood, you might tap from it. Like if your neck's a bit jacked or whatever, or it's just training, but really like they can't really get it, right? Guillotines are another one, right? A very white belt thing, 
You know, they'll have a guillotine. The person will go to side control to defend the guillotine and they won't let go because they they don't yet realize that from that angle you can't finish a guillotine. Yeah. So And they gas their own arms. And they gas and their own arms. Wait. And then you von flute choke them. Yep. And then go <laughs> spit on them. <laughs> kick them as you get, get your up. No. Forearm in the, <laughs> their face. So like I mean, take that concept on both sides, right? It's a very and I actually think it's probably the most valuable piece of of generalized advice for escaping submissions. Like I said, if someone said just one piece of advice to escape any and every submission, it would be like, oh, we'll just ruin the angle, mm-hmm. right? Obviously every submission has its own angle and whatever, even even heel hooks, right? Like the way that they're done a lot nowadays with the whole bridging into the side of the knee, mm-hmm. you know, or it, let's take something even a little less complicated, like a knee bar, if you can ruin the angle and now they're not hyperextending your knee, same with arm bars, right? So. It's also take that concept with you attacking the submission, right? You need, to, you need to be the one controlling the angle the same way they're trying to ruin it. So if you're the one attacking the submission and you can maintain the correct angle for that particular submission that you're trying to apply, it's going to be way harder for them to escape. And that in turn is going to facilitate and increase the likelihood that you finish that submission. Mm-hmm. Because once everything's – once the angle's in control and – it's locked in and everything. There's then not really that much technical application on top of that. Yeah, you can go into some sort of minute details of like the exact thing you do to squeeze the rear naked choke and rotate in the hand and finger mm. go here. But to some degree, once a submission is locked in, the final application is, is I mean, kind of just strength, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, like there's not – if you're bridging to finish an armbar – there's not a big technical difference between how a white belt would inherently bridge and how a black belt would bridge. Mm-hmm. Like there's not a huge technical difference in extending and pushing your hips forward or whatever. Mm-hmm. So make sure you as the person attacking the submission, you dominate the angle, control the angle. Yeah. I'm sure most people listening would have thrown up a triangle from closed guard and they would have experienced when they cut the angle really nicely and they got the opponent dead to rights. And I'm sure they would have felt when – they either mess it up or the person in the triangle manages to ruin your angle and then there's no triangle anymore mm-hmm. at all, mm-hmm. right? And then, I don't know, switch to – there's obviously multiple things that could play out. That The armbar is a good example for this angle because it's I think maybe it's the most intuitive of the lot. If you really understand those angles, maybe you have the armbar, they ruin the angle on you and then you take it over your opposite hip. Yeah, there's always yeah, that, that Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Understanding that concept. And well, that goes in hand with understanding how how that particular joint needs to be yeah. manipulated. So it's both of them, right? exactly. Yeah. But yeah, that armbar one's a, a, a good one because if whenever I'm teaching a, a an armbar from mount, and I've passed the initial very beginner teaching an armbar, which I usually point out, this is how you'll you, oh, this is your second class ever. Cool. Like this, you would learn an armbar in this manner, which Mm -hmm. is not how it would really be applied Mm -hmm. in a real life uh, scenario, right? But they beginners need bigger movements to work with, Mm -hmm. right? They can't yet work with like the 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 micro movements. So, but then once we're going to okay, you pass that beginner. Now we're doing a more technical application of an armbar, and people will tend to not actually turn their hips that 90 degrees, you know, and they'll stay facing front on and then wonder why they, you know, they're not being able to put their leg over the head or whatever, you know, and their hips aren't up under the shoulder. And it's like, man, because you haven't created the correct angle, you know, and and that's important to understand because the person on the bottom, if they can keep you centered and ruin that angle for you, you're like, they're going to ruin the armbar for you. So you have to control the angle. Mm. Angles are everything. Fucking geometry <laughs> that's the angle one right? <laughs> I don't, uh, I think so. shit. retractors <laughs> yeah yeah get yourself a protractor and a compass yeah and you'll be better at jujitsu definitely yeah but um they're 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 my concepts for for vastly i mean there's more that we could talk about you know uh but they're my ones that i really like you know i think understanding joint manipulation and how that particular joint works in the particular submission, not just the joint, but the submission. Like I gave the example of triangles, arm triangles, dust chokes, like understanding how that submission is applied and why it works. And I think that's important. Like another one, like whenever you would have seen me teach North South chokes 
and I go into quite a lot of detail, not every time I teach it, yep. but there's times where I'll spend 30 minutes just going into getting a bit Danaher about it because it is a way more complicated like choke. Getting your lap people. into the into Yeah, the side of so the you've got to understand how the choke or submission actually works. Push their head the other way. And how it's being yep. manipulated, right? Yeah. And uh, connecting those with the with the head arm, like for ages I didn't understand really how a head arm choke worked. I thought it was more like I was just trying to crank it. But as soon as I connected that, it's literally the same as a triangle – and your yeah. bicep needs to be on the other side of their neck. You need to drive their shoulder into their neck. Then it, it like clicks. And you're like, oh, it's oh so it's a, fuck, it's a fucking choke now. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's not a crank. <laughs> <laughs> People never tapped to my uh, my intense fucking head arms, and it was just cranking them, and I didn't understand why. But yeah. I get it. I get it now. Yeah, they Sometimes weren't tapping. You were just off. letting go once you heard their neck pop. Oh, yeah, are like, you okay? Oh, you paralyzed now? <laughs> oh, that's another one, Adam. <laughs> wiggle, wiggle your toes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the stretches are full. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, you know, understanding the the application of the submission and how it actually works. Angles, man, angles are super, super important. Mm. And spoke at the start about how I like to apply chokes. You know, that's more of a incremental trick or tip or I don't know, than a concept. Yeah. But um yeah, that's that's me on submission concepts application for beginners to hopefully help them, you know hit more submissions more successfully and you know like anything new you you apply to your your jujitsu often has one step back two steps forward yeah. because whenever you're putting something new into your in and changing the way you currently uh fight jujitsu you've always got kind of like blinkers on so you kind of stop seeing all the other things that you usually see because you're so focused on this one particular aspect but once that gets brought up to par and then kind of seamlessly folds into everything else. And then, you know, then you've made that progressional step forward, but, you know, be okay that, you know, you, you, you might then listen to this episode, go away, throw up a submission, then be like, fuck, what is it? Angles again? And oh fuck wrong angle. And then, you know, <laughs> lose a submission that typically you would get, but yeah. that's okay. It's a bit of a step back to make, you know, more leaps forward. No, oh, awesome. With that though, next episode will 110, be yep. 110. Yep. Q and A, uh, Q and A. Ask a black belt. Uh, I think there will be. We do still have time to get in more more questions if mm -hmm. people want to send mm -hmm. it through. So this episode will come out. You'll be able to listen to this episode and still have time to submit audio questions. Again, guys, it's in the link tree on our Instagram at Beyond Jiu Jitsu underscore podcast. Everything's there. Our Patreon, whatever you need to find, is all in the link tree. Uh, otherwise. I think that's about it, isn't it, Kieran? That's it. Thanks for listening and uh, until next time. Later.